So next we have uh, James Prestwich. He really did win that. Um, he's going to be talking about how zero-knowledge proofs can be used for cross-chain communication. This is one of my favorite topics, so I'm very curious to hear what you have to say about it. All right. Thanks, Anna. Oh, uh, you, the first thing you'll notice is that there might be misspellings in these slides. I don't actually spell check anything, and I made these very quickly. So uh, comms usually has two M's when we use it this way. All right. <laughs> Uh, so quick about me, I co-founded a company called Storage about five years ago. For the last two and a half years, I've been working on Summa. We work on cross-chain communication, focusing on Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other chains. Uh, we, we can like move on from that. Don't worry about it. We're here to talk about blockchains. Blockchains. All right, no laughs. Um, okay, so this is what Satoshi Nakamoto thought a blockchain looked like. He got it wrong. All of those arrows should be pointing the other direction. Um, typically, we uh, represent a block as like this prev hash and a nonce, and it's full of transactions. Um, there's a bunch more stuff that goes into a header. Bitcoin headers are about 80 bytes. Uh, Ethereum headers are about twice or three times that. Um, and a chain is just a collection of blocks where each one references the previous block. So this is uh, as opposed to Satoshi's wrong version. This is what a blockchain looks like. Okay. So uh, we follow valid chains only. So if you say stupid things, they don't get in the chain. That entire block becomes invalid. Uh, and we follow the heaviest chain in proof of work. In proof of stake, we use other uh, like fork choice rules. But uh, we're going to keep it on proof of work for a minute because it's a little simpler. So if there's any conflict between two observed histories, we follow the one with more work put into it over time. And this resolves conflicts, and so we follow the heaviest valid chain. And that determines what actually happened. You lose the invalid stuff like flat earth, it's just dumb and wrong. And if Alice tries to double spend funds, we have a you know objective metric for which history we follow. So chains, we talk a lot about what is valid, and we haven't put a lot of like work into thinking about what can be valid yet. This is something that we typically figure out kind of on the fly. Um, so if you're going to introduce rules into your consensus protocol, which I think most of us want some rules, uh, we have to figure out whether something can be valid in consensus. And the only things that can be valid are objective facts. Uh, we often say like publicly verifiable information. Uh, if you want something to go on chain, you know, it has to be something that everybody can check as part of the consensus protocol. Right, so everyone has to make the same decisions to confirm, conform to the same, to reach the same uh, consensus result. Uh, so that's why we can't have entropy. Um, time's fake. In uh, blockchains, like time is an illusion and it's really wibbly wobbly and sometimes goes backwards for no reason. Uh, we can't have real world information. So this is what Joey was talking about earlier with oracles. That's a way to route around this limitation on public verifiability. And uh, we actually can't spend a lot of resources on chain because everybody has to run the same thing. It's called the verifier's dilemma. Uh, if you're checking somebody's work and they've put a thousand computer hours and you only have a desktop, you just can't do that. So every time you do something expensive on chain, or if you permit that in your chain, it limits the nodes that can be in consensus with you. So if you have expensive operations, you actually have a much smaller consensus set. Uh, if you look at EOS, they really only have 21 nodes in consensus, and everybody else is just running light clients all the time because of this problem. So what is an objective fact? Uh, proof of work. Uh, history, so all past chain state, everything we've reached consensus on before is an objective fact. Uh, any signed message, we say that uh, probably ECDSA is pretty secure right now, so anything I see that's been signed by a pub key, I have you know, an objectively verifiable criteria and can admit it into the chain. And uh, other cryptography, uh, hash functions, ZKPs, uh, whatever kind of proofs you want. So. We're kind of limited in what we can do on a chain to these four things, basic categories. Uh, so what about other chains? We're here to talk about cross-chain communication. Um, really, cross-chain communication is about verifying the consensus process of a remote chain in the local chain. Uh, so let's, let's unpack that a little bit. We already said we can't do expensive computations. 
isn't a, a block, yeah, blockchains are pretty expensive. Uh, if any of you have ever tried to sync an Ethereum node, it's, it's not a like simple task. It typically takes days, uh, weeks if you want a full sync. And uh, last time I tried to run an archival, it just wouldn't come up at all. Um, we added blocks faster than it could process and store them. Um, so we have this thing that's seven, eight years old now in Bitcoin called SPV, which stands for Special Pur uh, Sorry, um, <laughs> Simple Payment Verification. Um, uh, that was from my fundraising deck, excuse me. Um, so with SPV, we have these blocks, uh, and blocks go in a chain, and uh, we'll just make them real small. Take those blocks, pack them real small. Uh, so what we actually do is, you know, you remember our block, take all the transactions out, and now it's just about 80 bytes instead of uh, a megabyte or 1.4 or whatever Bitcoin actually is this week. Um, and so to do that, we use what's called the SPV assumption, which is that miners check validity. All right, so let's talk about that for a second before we move on. We've already said we follow the heaviest valid chain in SPV. We don't check validity. We can't know what is valid. That's how we get the like, computational savings. We have to process 80 bytes instead of 1.4 megabytes. Uh, so we're assuming that someone else is checking validity and that the chain that is heaviest will be valid. Uh, the headers alone give us enough information to check weight. So we can follow just seeing 80 byte headers which chain is heaviest, but we don't necessarily know that it is the objectively correct Bitcoin chain. We have a high degree of confidence, but not absolute certainty. So it's an additional weaker security assumption than running a full node. But as we talked about earlier, you can't run a full node in another blockchain. You'd be running a full node in your full node, and so uh, it just, recursion is bad. Um, okay, so we can use the SPV assumption to make headers small enough to process on other chains. Uh, we're running a relay on Robston right now. It, runs a Bitcoin header through Robston every 10 minutes, give or take. Uh, we estimate it costs about $150 a month to maintain, to stay up to date with Bitcoin consensus at current gas rates. Uh, so that's uh, cheap enough to do on other chains, right? Um, well, uh, yes, but only for Bitcoin. Unfortunately, we went through this fad four or five years ago around the time Ethereum launched of memory hard proof of work which has turned into a dead end and an endless nightmare of debate that we won't go into right now. Um, we haven't seen it produce any objective benefits, and it has this awful side effect of making headers awfully expensive to parse. For example, it takes something like 20 million gas in Ethereum to run a naive S-script execution, which means that you would need to fill up three or four Ethereum blocks to process a single Litecoin header, and we run Litecoin headers every two, two and a half minutes, give or take. Uh, Zcash's headers are 1.5 kilobytes for no good reason. It's just a bad idea. So we can't actually run those things on any other chain, practically speaking. It's just too expensive to do in the consensus process. Um, and uh, proof of stake. In proof of work, uh, we validate one hash and one hash per header, which costs like 120 gas in Ethereum, is sufficient to follow Bitcoin's chain history. In proof of stake, we would need to be checking messages from all validators against all past chain state, which means we would, be, we would need to store all validator balances at the time they enter the validator set, and then validate signatures from each validator uh, as they sign messages for each block. Um, so if there's something like 20 validators signing ECDSA, uh, you're looking at something like uh, 400,000 gas for storage, each time the set changes, and something in the neighborhood of 40,000 gas per block minimum. And again, Bitcoin takes a few hundred gas per block. Uh, so it's something where validating proof of stake is orders of magnitude more expensive. Um, and obviously, like weird things like Ripple and Stellar Consensus, we can't do at all because they're kind of like federation-based and don't have an objective trust route. Uh, Stellar, you insert your own trust. So like, we can't interact with those in any meaningful way. All right, so Bitcoin is cheap enough to run on other chains, which is nice uh, because Bitcoin's the thing we actually all want anyway. It's a Bitcoin, Ethereum, and then everything else, right? Yeah? Okay, good. Um, so 
how does ZKPs fit into this? Uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, public verifiability. Uh, we have another term that we like to use for this. Uh, it takes public verifiability, you know, like what is an objective fact, and adds on what is an objective fact that we can practically verify on chain. And we call this observability, right? So we want to make our blocks light so that we can observe them from within a chain. And if it's too heavy, we can't observe it. If it uses randomness, we can't observe it because it's not publicly verifiable. Okay, so we wanna make our blocks light. This means something that the other chain can practically validate. Uh, and so we don't actually need to make the blocks light, we need to make the verification overhead of those blocks light. This entire talk isn't about like following Bitcoin consensus, it's about what is the verification overhead of checking remote chains. And that's where ZKPs come in and are really useful. We can use cryptography to solve our blockchain problems. Okay, so ZKPs allow us to make you know, arbitrary statements about information which means we could make some statement like, I know of 12 Litecoin headers that form a cohesive chain with work totaling X. Um, so we can summarize in a very small, cheap to validate statement, a very large and expensive statement that would take millions of gas. And that's how we can use ZKPs to aid cross-chain communication we can make proofs about the remote consensus process that are efficiently verified in the local consensus process. Okay, so this opens up relays to more proof of work chains, like Litecoin, if we had a good uh, ZKP representation of S-Crypt, um, and potentially proof of stake chains, but they're still probably expensive. Uh, so proof of stake has this annoying well, kind of like we use memory hard proof of work in so many proof of work chains. Uh, very few chains are designed for, um, hmm. chains use signature schemes and hash functions that are not amenable to ZKPs. We use like ECDSA or EDDSA, um, and those are quite expensive to do in most ZKP constructions. And we use SHA-2 and other like bit mashing based hash constructions which are very expensive to do in zero knowledge proofs. Uh, so the one significant exception to this is CODA. CODA designed their entire consensus process and state model and every primitive selection around being efficiently provable. Um, and, uh, the Cosmos approach to this, uh, shout out to Zucky who's in here somewhere, um, was to design Tendermint to be efficiently verifiable by other Tendermint chains. Uh, it's a bit more complex than that, but the goal of Cosmos was to make relaying efficient so that you didn't have to do ZKPs. Okay, all right, so future plans. What, what, what am I actually like building here? Uh, I still don't know. Um, Right now, we're working on Bitcoin Relay and Bitcoin-based contracts in Ethereum, Cosmos, and other chains. I would love to kind of apply this and apply ZKPs to other problems in cross-chain communication, uh, but it's very difficult to tell what's useful to other people and useful to engineers, and I would love to take questions or suggestions. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, hi, uh, there used to be this thing called BTC Relay, and I know that some people even like try to write basic dApps that would allow you to like trade tokens for Bitcoin and stuff. Um, so it, actually I think someone stopped pushing headers to that like years ago, and what would you do, what would you like to do better that, like what do you think the cause was that it didn't work out, or what would you improve to make it more popular? So. There's a few different answers to that question. Um, like I know the team that wrote BTC Relay. Uh, part of it was Serpent, is people moved away from Serpent very quickly. Uh, but part, the other part is just that BTC Relay stored something like, I wanna say six or eight slots per header. Um, and newer Relay constructions, like we've been working on and running, store one and a quarter slots per header. So already there's just like, uh, 4x overhead on gas costs for BTC Relay. Um, the other answer is that at the time we had no evidence and no market had developed for cross-chain communication at all. 
and I think we're still extremely early for this. Uh, so BTC Relay was like three years earlier than very early, and I think that was its main downfall. Cool, thanks. Hey, uh, cool talk, thanks. Uh, have you, you've heard of Fly Client, this protocol, right? Yeah, um, we're actually working on Merkle Mountain Range commitments for Zcash. Oh, uh, you're doing that work, okay, really yeah. cool. So how does, um, do you think you can get better than Fly Client with ZKP, like, like stocks or whatever? Do you think you can do better than that, or is that pretty good? Um, potentially, Fly Client is pretty good. It allows us to do a logarithm, woo, okay. Um, it allows us to do a uh, update that can do any number of headers and is logarithmic in the number of headers. The problem is Fly Client requires like Fiat Shamir, and so if we want to have an on-chain Fly verifier, we're going to be needing to do Fiat Shamir on-chain, which is a bit of a mess. Uh, we've looked at uh, Fly-based optimistic relays, um, so Fly Client commitments would allow efficient fraud proofs, which means we could use optimistic like uh, techniques rather than direct verification. Um, it is an additional security assumption because you're assuming that a uh, fraud prover can get a transaction on chain in a certain amount of time. And for a relay to be useful, that amount of time must be very low. Uh, however, like Fly Client is still really interesting. Uh, your original question before I went off on a tangent was can ZKPs do better? The answer is that you could actually probably ZKP the verification of a fly client proof if you really wanted to. The main question in my mind is how expensive will that prover be to run? Uh, when we ZKP complex things composed of many hash functions, uh, the prover gets awfully expensive awfully fast, and I have no way of benchmarking this in my mind yet. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great approach. And uh, the, I have uh, two questions. The first one is, where do you want to store uh, these uh, small blocks? And is it, it will be on chain or is it like some other chain? I'll, so, yes. So right now we're running a Bitcoin relay on Ropsten and uh, we actually don't store blocks. Uh, when I said earlier that it costs 1.25 slots per header, in Ethereum a storage slot is 32 bytes. So we're actually storing uh, what's a quarter of 32, uh, eight. We're storing 40 bytes per header instead of 80 bytes. Um, and the way we do that is by abstracting the blockchain down to its minimal thing, which is links in the chain. Uh, so the relay stores on chain in Ethereum or in Cosmos or wherever, uh, for each header, the parent hash of that header, and for every fourth header, the height of that header. Um, and so it's absolute minimal impact on the state of the host chain, but it's still kind of unavoidable if you want to use that relay in host chain smart contracts. Thank you. And second thing is like, what kind of parameters do you want to verify uh, by ZKP from uh, the big block headers? What what the most important information to verify? Uh, typically the most important information to verify is the proof of work on a proof of work chain or the you know staking process on a proof of stake chain. Uh, we're looking to observe the remote chain's consensus protocol. Um, and so practical limitations prevent that for most chains. Uh, so we'd be looking to snark the signature algorithms or the uh, like tendermint consensus or the proof of work uh, hash function. Thank you. Are there any other questions? All right. Thank you, James.